Anyone who's a fan of the channel will know that I absolutely love to scratch build 1.6 scale models. The size is really large, they're really fun to work on, and when you're done with it, the end result always looks great. A lot of people wonder exactly how do I go about doing that? Well, I have lots of reference photographs of the real one, I have some blueprints, but it's also a really good idea to have a small one to be used as a builder's aid. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale Cadillac Gauge V100 Commando armor car or also known as the XM706. The model in this video here is built for my own personal collection and it's not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. If anyone is getting a sense of deja vu, that's because you're a frequent viewer of the channel, and if you are, thank you for that. And if you're not, feel free to hit that little subscribe button, it definitely helps out with the channel growth. But aside from that, your brain is properly working because this is not the first time that I brought one of these 135th scale V100 kits to video. A little while ago, I built another rendition of this exact same vehicle with this exact same kit, and that model is the subject matter of its own model showcase video, and it can be found on the ECA channel, as well as I have the direct link to that listed below in the video description. And if you're wondering why do I have two of these examples in my collection, well fear not, I'm going to be going over all that information in this video, as well as also going over several aspects of the model that I went ahead and added to this one, which differentiates it from the previous build. In this video, we're going to be going over all this information, as well as giving the model a brief inbox review, so stay tuned because there's going to be a bunch of cool info coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the Cadillac Gauge V100 Commando armored car, also known in the U.S. military service as the XM706. This was a light armored car that was designed by the company Cadillac Gauge back in the late 1950s into the early 1960s time frame. This vehicle was interesting because this was a purely private venture. This was not answering a military contract or anything along those lines. Cadillac Gauge built this vehicle specifically for just international military sales and also police sales as well. The vehicle's design was a simple four-wheel drive, fully enclosed armored car. Unlike many other armored cars that have a frame with a armored shell built upon it, the V100 utilized an all-monocoque design. For the running gear and the suspension, the vehicle utilized as many off-the-shelf components as possible, which did both streamline production time as well as research and development. It also made obtaining spare parts and maintenance much easier and streamlined compared to making something dedicated for this vehicle from the ground up. When the vehicles first entered production, they utilized a Chrysler 8-cylinder engine, and the engine was a gasoline-powered engine. This was not a diesel-powered vehicle, or specifically during this time frame. What's interesting about this vehicle was that it kind of fell into place at the perfect time. During this period, the United States was actively involved in the Vietnam conflict, and one problem that the U.S. military was encountering was that their supply lines were being attacked and ambushed by the Viet Cong. And the MPs really did not have sufficient armor and a vehicle in order to deal with these threats. They were just making do with trying to up armor mutts as well as also up armor standard deuce and a half trucks, but they did not have a dedicated vehicle that was factory built to deal with this type of situation. And lo and behold, the Cadillac Gauge Commando was right over there on the market and it was literally the perfect vehicle for this application. Because of the armor composition, the vehicle was pretty much impervious to small arms fire, and basically the only real thing that could knock this vehicle out would be an RPG or a very large roadside bomb. Unlike the gun trucks, as well as the up-armored mutts, where the gunners were fully exposed, with the V100, the gunner was safely encased inside the vehicle with his own fully revolving turret that was armed with any litany of weapons that either came stock from the factory or that could have been field-modified in theater. The 
Other provisions that the vehicle had were several pistol ports, so other crew members can still engage the enemy while still contained safe inside their vehicle. The vehicles performed extremely well in Vietnam, however, after the war ended, the US military really didn't know what to do with them, so sadly a lot of them wound up as range targets or they were just straight up scrapped. That's not the end of the story of this vehicle type, however, because after Vietnam, the Cadillac HV100 was still in full production and was a very successful seller on the international market, and many of them are still in use today by various foreign militaries as well as police forces. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started to get a good idea on what the base starter kit looked like. And here's the model at the start of the project. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 135th scale M706 armored car kit from Hobby Boss. Normally at this point of the video, I would go ahead and give this model a thorough inbox review and go over the kit's history. However, I'm not really going to do that with this model over here because frankly put, I've already done that to great length in the other model showcase video of the exact same kit. The reason why we have the duplicate one here on the table has to do with my 1-6 scale counterpart. Anyone who's a fan of the channel will tell you that I'm currently working on a 1-6 scale version of the exact same vehicle and just like I frequently mentioned in those other videos, if you're scratch building or working on any larger scale model, it really helps to have a smaller one on hand to act as a builder's aid and you can utilize that as a reference point and it will definitely assist with the build. Well, I was definitely going to do that with my V100 and I bought the other model in question. However, before I was about to start that model, I was actually contacted by the wife of an associate of mine and regrettably the individual had passed away. Upon his passing, the widow contacted me and she had a few models that she wanted to get rid of and, you know, I definitely helped her out and she sent me a few kits, this of course being one of them. The model itself was partially opened by the individual. He did not start it or he removed a few parts off of the sprues, but the model itself is still left mostly intact. Because I had the other one on hand that was completely mint in box, that one made a far better candidate to do the model showcase video on because it shows the viewer exactly what you get in the box. This one here, it's not nearly as good, so this one here instead I utilized as the builder's aid and the other one was built and completed about a year or so ago. So fast forward to the point we're at now, the 1-6 scale model, that build is really winding down. I'm literally at the time filming this, waiting for the last three printed components to come in. And once they come in, that model could actually cruise to the finish line. So with that model at that point now, I don't need this model anymore as a builder's aid. And therefore, this one here can just enter into standard production, which is exactly what I'm going to do right now. One other thing I do want to touch upon since the previous video was that I had an error when I talked about the kit history where I said that the kit was designed in 2017 and that was actually a mistake and the funny thing is it was a mistake that I knew but for some reason I defaulted to what was stated on the box. These kits are actually older than that. These kits were tooled up by Hobby Boss in 2008 or so. So these models are a bit 10 years older compared to what's labeled on the box. When these kits came out they actually came out to quite a bit of fanfare because the XM706 and basically the entire Cadillac Gage V100 family were the one of those vehicles that were ignored and overlooked by basically all the other major modeling companies for a multitude of decades. Which is funny because this vehicle here is, is a very iconic vehicle. It was used to great extent in Vietnam. And the V100 is a very successful platform utilized by a multitude of different countries even up till today. But because of one reason or another, Dragon, I guess, was too busy making another version of the Panzer IV. But, and Tamiya was just being Tamiya. So regardless, Hobby Boss coming out with this kit here was one that was met with open arms because before this kit came out, if you wanted a V100 of one flavor or another, you were either gonna have to scratch build one or you were gonna get one of the Vera Leiden all resting kits uh, or something along those lines. But this kit here being released in plastic and for the price point that it had was definitely a very gracious addition to add to the market. Over the years, I believe what happened was that Hobby Boss went ahead and probably changed some verbiage or something on the box, and by doing so, they had to update the copyright info, which is why these boxes here have the date of 2017. In addition to this particular kit, Hobby Boss released basically a wide range of the Cadillac Gage family, from this version to the Air Force version, with which is the uh, 706 
uh, XM706E2, if I'm not mistaken. I actually did a walk around on that. Uh, in addition to that, they've released several of the V150 series of vehicles that are, again, utilized by a multitude of different countries. And all of them have some excellent tooling on them and make for excellent builds. I wouldn't mind picking up the other ones in the future, but for now, let's just stick at the with the model at hand, I should say. So, not going too much into the box art and graphic design, as I already mentioned that before, but I will briefly touch upon, again, that the fellow in the Commander's Turret over there has a striking resemblance to the fellow from Tremors. And every time I see this box art, I keep thinking of that movie and that really awesome scene. But, uh, regardless, like I said before, the model is a multimedia kit. So, also, as I said before, the parts are unbagged because, again, it was being used as a builder's aid. I believe the parts are still on the runners. I don't believe I detached them or anything. I was just using them for dimensions by and large. Everything is made out of injection molded plastic, but there are components made out of rubber. And also this kit supplies you with parts made out of photo etch and even a length of metal chain, which is a very nice touch. And again, it's just, you know, indicative of a kit being produced in the modern era. As for the molding details, they are pretty good. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is that it is a mistake found on this model here it are the wheel wells. The wheel wells are incorrect for the XM706. If you look at a real vehicle, instead of being rounded like this over here, they're actually boxy and angular in shape. And this is something that is a error found on this model, as well as many of the interior detailings. After studying this vehicle since I built the last one, even having the opportunity to see and ride in a real Cadillac Gage XM706, yeah, the this one here, the interior is very, very, very lacking, and it does have some mistakes in it. Overall, good build, but yeah, there's definitely some things that are, uh, yeah, it, it wouldn't hurt to update, but you know, we'll touch upon that as the video goes on. As for the upper and lower hull, two-piece assembly, as you can see. It does have the correct shape for the V100, and it does have the funky angles that this vehicle does have. I'll mess with that later, but uh, as the parts go on, again, everything is molded in this gray polystyrene plastic. By the way, Hobby Boss is a sister company for Trumpeter, so what you're seeing here is Trumpeter tooling, and Trumpeter does some excellent quality kits, as I've touched upon numerous times before. Some suspension parts. We do have some spare parts that are found in this model because some of the components are intended for use on the V150. And obviously for the XM706, they have some dedicated parts just for that vehicle. So you are gonna have some extra components like extra rims for the later variants, as well as also some extra armament. We have here the German pattern of smoke grenade launchers and even a few, uh, what are those, uh, FM mag MGs that are present on this tooling as well. The machine guns are very nicely rendered, but again, this is something that's you know gonna be left in the spare parts bin. They did come in handy though on a few other builds that I have mentioned already in the past, so that's something to consider. Here goes some interior details, as well as a few other components. Running gear, rubber tires, which are excellently rendered, as you can see right here. They have a nice thread pattern to them. The material is nice and soft, and the color that they are molded in is excellent You to the point where you don't paint them. Uh, the one on my other build, and this one's going to follow suit. You're not, I'm not going to add any paint to the surfaces. I'm just going to add the weathering on top of it, and you'll get some pretty decent and very nicely realistic results. Another thing that was found on this kit here is clear plastic components. So that's excellent. They consist of the periscopes that are found on the side portions of the vehicle, the headlights, the tail lights, and I believe the, yes, the side view mirrors are also integrally molded in this clear plastic, which is fantastic. Here goes the PE that I was referencing before. You have the brush guard screens right over here found on the front, which were basically present on all of the XM706s in Vietnam. And we have a nice little chain over here for the, the winch found in the front. We also have a set of water slide decals. These are typical blue paper backing, modern, printing of water slide decals. There are two options available for this kit to be rendered. I built the MP version, this version in the last video. So obviously for this one here, I'm gonna roll with this pattern that is supplied on the decal sheet. Of course, last but not least, we have here the instructions, booklet type affair. If anyone has built any of the modern kits from Trumpeter, what you see is what you get. Everything is CAD drawings, and from what I remember on the previous build, I don't recall any issues with misprints or any other type of problems found on the instructions themselves. So, what you see is pretty much what you get, which will make for a pretty straightforward build.
And here's the model going through its course of construction. Just like I often do in these videos, whenever a model has some interior detailing, it's best to record it at this point before it progresses any further, because this is when you really get to appreciate what the kit has with its interior detailing, and it's obviously a bit harder to do once it's all fully sealed up. Just like I mentioned earlier on in the unboxing portion, of all of this kit's strengths and with all of the positive attributes that it brings to the table, the interior and by extension the lower hull are definitely not one of them. That's actually arguably probably the worst aspect of this kit. Now, the interior is nice that they do give it to you, but it's more or less an afterthought than anything else. If you're looking for a 135th scale V100 armor car and you want to have it with the interior being one of its most important key points, then you're going to be very disappointed with this kit and definitely you're going to find this kit lacking. The interior, I'm not even sure if it's even like this on the V150s because it seems like that many aspects they just completely made up when they were coming up with this kit. Even the rear section over here that I'll touch upon in a moment. But, you know, since I have everything fully fleshed out, might as well go ahead and show what actually the kit gives you. So here you can see the interior bottom portion. First, for the paintwork, this was all done with Tamiya Sky. As I touched upon in a couple other videos, on US military vehicles, the official color is called Seafoam Green, and a very good alternative to that, or a good match to that, is Tamiya Sky. It's acrylics applied via the airbrush, but of course, before I do that, the entire model is thoroughly primed with the flat black spray paint. Same thing's gonna be done to the outer extremities towards the tail end of the build, but the same is also done to the interior. The Tamiya Sky is airbrushed on, and then I went ahead and weathered it with the following you know, formats, with the use of airbrushing, the Tamiya panel line accent, as well as also some dry brushing, giving you the effects that you see here. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's go ahead and go over what the interior of this model does give you. I'm going to start from the rear, and I'm going to start with this, what's supposed to be a engine slash transmission cluster, and I'm just going to come out and say it, it's completely and utterly wrong. It's almost like I said before, the designers who came up with this kit simply just made this up, and it's almost as if they never seen the inside of a V100 before. Now I can't speak to the V150s and the later versions, but I've definitely not only seen the XM706, but I've even, you know, photographed it and took a ride in one. So I know this a bit better compared to some of the other versions. And I get to honestly say this interior here is completely bogus. So on the real vehicle, this whole section here would be cordoned off from the remainder of the vehicle and you would have the engine. The engine is not covered by any sort of cowling or anything like that. It's just a straight up engine found on the inside and you have the fans to the radiator and all the other accoutrements that would be found on the engine compartment. And on the kit here, it is just a 180 of that. So we have this box here with some louvers in it. I mean, you know, granted the detailing looks good, it's nicely molded, but it's horribly wrong. On the top portion here, you do have the ability to have the engine hatches, uh, I believe, in the open position. And if you do, you're gonna be seeing that on the inside as opposed to a proper engine compartment. So yeah, you really don't wanna have this with the hatches open. The side over here, you have this type of detailing, but again, on the real vehicle, this would all be cordoned off and would be a bulkhead type system, and this is how you would enter and exit the vehicle from the rear. Also, the floorboards are also completely wrong and wouldn't look like this on the real vehicle. There would be the radio station over here on the rear section, and this is where you would have a tray for the radio equipment that would be mounted on the inside. On the kit here, absolutely absent, nothing back here whatsoever. I've already touched upon the wheel well shapes before, and yes, that's still true here. The, the shape on these wheel wells are completely wrong. On the middle portion of the fighting compartment, you have this cluster over here, and this is somewhat resembling the transmission system found on the real vehicle. However, the geometry is still very different. It's uh, like a close approximation if that and that's being very generous but again you know what you see here is what the kit gives you again detailing is nice and crisp it's just the geometry that's horribly wrong we do have some seats that are found in these sections over here this is somewhat true to form there are some benches found on the real one but they are very different design compared to these ones here on the driving compartment it's the only thing it has in common is that it has a seat some levers for the transmission and also a steering wheel. Everything else is completely and utterly wrong. The pedals right over here, it's a nice little feature, but again, everything is just 
as far off from the true to form one as you can imagine. We have a fire extinguisher found right here on the front as well as a bulkhead that goes to nowhere. And probably the biggest ding found on the, tr on the interior is the emission of two things. First are the fuel tanks. On the V100 armor car, these here are your fuel tanks on either side of the front. And this whole section here, you would have the fuel tanks present, you know, found on the inside. The other thing that is definitely a, a piece that's missing, and in my opinion, it's a, you know, a pretty major one, is the winch. So on the model here, we just have the winch, and it's just this nice little rectangle cut open into the front section, and it's literally open into the interior of the model. This couldn't be any more wrong compared to the real life unit. On the real unit, there's a whole box found on this side over here, and this is where the winch mechanism is held, and you get access to it from the top portion of the vehicle. With the model over here, no, you just have access directly into the inside. The winch needs to be in a box. Obviously, one, it, it's for, you know, makes it watertight so this thing can swim. And if you have a giant hole like that into the interior, you can see how that's going to be a problem. Uh, but also, you know, you just don't want, you know, rounds or any other things coming inside the vehicle. So obviously, this whole section here is cordoned off. Again, on the kit here, it's lacking. Uh, you can potentially scratch build a box around this structure over here. I may do that. Uh, that's something that remains to be seen. I'm not going to do the winch detailing on the inside. I'm just going to, you know, just seal it off just so it's not open to the inside of the model. But then again, for this model here, it's just a curbside type build and it's not really that important, but it is one of those things that does kind of bug me. With the way the kit is designed, it does give you a length of chain to simulate the winch and basically you just leave the chain dangling on the inside. It's uh, as haphazard as you can imagine. And again, it just seems like this section here, they just didn't even finish it when they were phoning it in. So again, that's probably the biggest ding on the kit. On the upper body over here, there's literally nothing in terms of interior detailing. What you see here is just stock with the model. And what you see is literally what you get. So I just painted and weathered it accordingly with the same painting techniques that I utilized on the lower portion. Then this brings us to the turret. And the turret is as lackluster in terms of interior detailing as you can imagine in that there's literally none. Zippo, nothing on the inside. There's no mantlet. There's no MGs. There are no optics equipment. There's no rotation system. Literally nothing. This is what the kit is actually gives you. Also in the real unit, there is a cage that descends down from the turret. It's a platform for the gunner to sit on, and that too is completely absent on this model over here. The next thing to mention are the lower hull sections, such as the transmission. These go together pretty easily. Uh, Detail-wise, more or less they are what's found on the real one, but the geometry on them is also something that's a bit incorrect. But fortunately, these pieces are not visible once everything is installed in place, and it's implied detailing at best. The units are currently primed, as is the remainder of the lower hull, as well as the other fittings like the shock absorbers and other things along those lines. And the bottom portion is going to be pre-painted with its base coat after the upper hull section is permanently glued on, and all this seam work is contended with. This is done just so that I prevent any sort of chances there being any areas that are missed with the paint and everything is thoroughly painted. As for the lower sections, like I touched upon before, this too is very, very, very inaccurate, but in terms of the geometry of the whole cutouts for the transmissions and also again for the steering on the real vehicle, this whole section over here would look nothing like this and actually would have an have a cutout found in this section over here where we have a hydraulic ram and a clevis and that's what actually steers the vehicle. On the back portion over here, this too is also inaccurate. This this cutout section would not be present. In fact, you would have a channel found in this section over here. Basically, this area here for the shock absorber would go all the way down to this area here. And this is the clearance in order for the shock absorber to make contact with the rear transmission or uh, the rear differential section. So if you're watching this and I completely obliterated this kit in your eyes, and if you're saying to yourself, but John, I really do still want a proper 135th scale V100 with, you know, the interior detailing, well, there is a solution out there. Not all is lost. There is an aftermarket source that produces an entire replacement lower pan over here in cast resin. That one is far more accurate and solves basically all of the problems that this kit does have. However, you are going to be leaving the confines of the kit and you're now going to be working with cast resin aftermarket parts, which some people out there just don't have a skill set with working in. If you do not have a skill set with working with cast resin and doing some hand fitting and things along those lines, 
lines, you're not really going to be left with much options. In fact, at the time of filming this, this is still the only game in town for an XM706. Now, before I completely and utterly obliterate this kit in terms of, you know, uh, what it brings to the table, I still enjoy the model because the exterior portion is still a win. They still did a decent job with the exterior detailings, barring the cavern on the inside for the winch, but outside of that, the remainder of the model is perfectly fine, builds well, and if you're just looking for a standard, you know, uh, tabletop, the curbside type build this model here will definitely do a job and if anything the implied interior detailing will actually help because it'll give you something to look at through the clear plastic windows and visors that are found on the hull and that's really the job of the interior it's definitely not supposed to be a true to form piece uh it's very similar i would uh, say to some of those die cast cars out there or other die cast models where you know, you have very limited interior detailing, but you can still see some of it through the windows, and it's like, oh, look at that, there's some interior detailing in there. So that's really the mindset that, that you need to have with this type of build here. And uh, I am, you know, jumping ahead a little bit to skill level and recommendations, but again, if you're looking for a true-to-form V100, both inside and out, this kit's probably going to be a bit of a disappointment for you. So the interior on this model is going to be left stock. However, the one thing that I am going to make a change to is with the winch area for the reasons that I touched upon before. So for this one, I just went really, really simple and also really old school. And I went ahead and cobbled together this little thing that we have here. This is nothing more than a space filler and it's going to give the basic overall detailing on what would be found on the actual unit. So it's comprising of two pieces. We just have here a block this was machined out of a solid block of scrap resin i put on the mill and i basically milled it out to the condition that we have here and the tube section over here is just some plastruck tube or i'm sorry uh, evergreen styrene tube i keep getting those two confused uh it's evergreen styrene uh, tube cut it to shape install it i drilled a hole over here so the chain can fit inside when it comes time for the installation of that part this is very 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 rudimentary compared to what the part looks like in real life if you want to know what this looks like i recommend checking out the one six scale v100 video and also the uh the real walk around video that i did of the vehicle and you'll have a better idea on what it looks like but regardless for this model over here this should be more than suffice right now this is going to be heading off at the paint weathering i'm going to add it once everything is completed and once fit in place you can see how it fills in this area here very nicely the top is going to be left open as it's going to fit up flush against the top portion over here, and that's not really going to be an issue. But at least it's much better than having just a basic open cavity right there on the inside of the vehicle. Starting with the model's running gear, all the detailing you see here is stock out of the box, and it goes together fairly well. When it comes for the differentials, one little aspect of the build that I do want to mention involves the shock absorber detailing. The kit does supply with shock absorbers and they are to scale, which means that they are very thin and because of that they can be fragile. And why, or I should say where this becomes applicable is when it comes time for securing the differential to the shock absorber itself. With the way the kit is designed, there is a hole in the center portion of the differential and the shock absorber just plugs into it. Also as a point of reference, that is incorrect, it's not like that on the real vehicle, but back to the kit in question when you're installing these pieces you want to make sure everything is lining up appropriately because if it doesn't and you're trying to force the piece in place the only thing you're going to achieve is breaking the thin shock absorber this is best done obviously before the tires are fitted in place so you get to feel everything out and everything fortunately does line up pretty well but it's one area of the build that the builder does need to pay a little caution to Aside from that, if I put the model on its side, you get to see what the completed suspension looks like in its final form. Everything that is a sub-assembly goes together pretty well and, again, pretty effortlessly by and large. The one area that I do want to reference, though, is with the well area as well as also with the differentials themselves. Like I mentioned before in this video, everything is thoroughly primed and then painted with the base coat before final installation. So... This is done because of obviously all of these little ingresses over here, you can easily have areas where the paint does not get to, and magically these areas will somehow still be visible to the eye. So in order to prevent any sort of problems like that, on a build like this, I always thoroughly prime and paint everything 
prior to installation. So the pieces were spray painted flat black. As we saw earlier, the entire lower was primed. But the same thing was also done to the differentials and some of the, also all of the uh, suspension components in general. Then with the airbrush, I airbrushed the base coat into the wells as well as onto the differentials and the suspension pieces individually. Once everything was dry, mounted in place, and this is the best insurance policy you can have in order to prevent any sort of missed paint areas. Yes, it adds a little bit of extra complexity to the build, and a little extra time because now you have to wait for things to dry, but it's one that will yield for a better end result. And that's not just true for this model over here, but it's also true for many other vehicles that are similar to this, be it fully tracked or fully wheeled or even in between. Other things I want to mention about the suspension is, like I referenced in the other video, it is a static suspension. And what I mean by that is that the wheels are not functional where you can't either have them pivot or model them in a pivoted manner. The way you see it is how the kit builds straight out of the box. Some builders out there may deem this to be a problem as a lot of builders for one reason or another, they like to have the wheels articulated either for a diorama or other display use. But for this one here, if you are going to go ahead and replicate in that format, you are going to have to leave the confines of the stock kit and you are going to have to start tinkering on your own with some modifications. Is this something that can be done? Yes, but again, it's going to require some extra skill sets in order to do so. On a similar note, the wheels are static. They are not able to roll or pivot. And this is something that I want to mention because some people out there may want to play with this thing as believe it or not I do get that question asked quite often and if that's you sadly no you cannot roll this thing the wheels are meant to be glued on in a static manner along the lines that you see here on the topic of the wheels this takes us to the material that they are made in like I mentioned before they are a multimedia assembly so we have some parts made out of standard plastic be it the rims and then the actual tire itself is made out of a rubber material and I personally think that is an excellent engineered piece because of that we have some nice detailing and also just has some very nice realistic results when you have real rubber represented on models it just makes it for in my opinion a higher quality piece and also it just looks more realistic as opposed to trying to take something that's standard plastic and making it resemble rubber is this possible oh of course you could do that with parts made out of resin parts made out of plastic but when the part is really made out of rubber it just has a little bit of a head start in my opinion there are some replacement wheels out there for this model made out of cast resin the advantage that those have that are not found on the kit ones is that i believe that they have the tire deformation on the bottom portion which if you look at a real vehicle with the weight onto the wheels you will see a slight little bulge in the bottom section don't believe me go ahead and look at your car and this is something that is absent on this kit over here but it is replicated i believe on the cast rest and sets that are available on the aftermarket scene if this is something that appeals to you again maybe it would be a good addition to add to this model while on the rear plate you can see the remainder of the stock detailing which would include the pioneer tools the tow hitch as well as the jerry can the jerry can is a multi-piece assembly as they are on most model kits out there so you are going to have some seam work to contend with again nothing too egregious and it's quite standard on these models the jerry can itself was painted in my usual format where we have the nylon strap painted with a slightly different color that was i believe to me a green drab or olive drab or no it was actually that's incorrect it was olive green specifically and we do have the little buckle here painted black that's molded into the piece on a lot of models out there the buckle is integrally molded on and a lot of individuals forget to paint that it's just one of those things on models that if you just go ahead and actually paint the pieces that are integrally molded on it just makes the model further more polished and just makes it look that much better of course, these units here were gasoline powered, and because of that, I, this is a gasoline jerry can as opposed to the water jerry can, and so I went ahead and rendered it with the sweaty weathering that would be right here on the cap section, which would not be uncommon for a fuel jerry can. As for the Pioneer tools, again, all stock components, painted off the, the runner and then installed at the very tail end of the build as I generally do on my vehicles. And as for the paintwork, this is a mix of olive drab as well as also to me a green drab. As on vehicles from this era, you will start seeing components that are overpainted or just all painted in a olive drab color of one flavor or another. 
You can also render these with having the wood handles represented to be just naked wood or treated wood, both of which would be appropriate for a vehicle from this vintage, and this just depends on the builder's personal taste. But regardless, each way is still accurate. Also, while on the back, we have here the shrouded taillights. These are the typical post-World War II taillights that would be found on vehicles from the 1960s era and onward. When you're painting these taillights, they're very different compared to the World War II cat's eye, where on one side it would be red and the other side would be a blackout light. For these lights over here, they were actually the exact same cluster, just mounted on either side of the vehicle. So you paint them in the exact same format. In addition to painting them, there's other things that you want to pay attention to, and that is what colors to paint them. So the top portion here would be red. Then there are two small little rectangular lights that are found on the, in the middle, as well as also on the bottom. These would be painted, or these are best represented by painting them in silver. You're going to need a very fine point paintbrush for this, and if you go ahead and paint these with the following colors, it just lends itself again for a nicely detailed and accurate piece. Moving towards the sides of the model, nothing really much to go over here. Everything is stock, but I do just want to mention the periscopes. The armored periscopes that are found on the vehicle, as you can see, there are many of them, and these are made out of clear plastic. For these type of components, these were literally the very last thing that get mounted to the vehicle at the tail end of the build. The reason why has to do with the paintwork. So when the model was ready for painting, these components were omitted at that time, and I went ahead and taped up all of these sections with some tissue paper as well as some masking tape, just to prevent any sort of overspray from getting into the interior of the vehicle. After the model was painted and weathered, these masks were all removed, and then it was time for the installation of the clear inserts. For the clear inserts themselves, I went ahead and painted the rims while still on the sprue, and this was probably the most tedious aspect of the entire build, and this did require a very good paintbrush to do so. The units actually were first painted with flat black, to me a flat black specifically, again with the paintbrush, and this made a great base to add the main base coat on top of that, which is exterior latex, and I'll circle back later on as the video goes on when I go over the paint. Regardless, the paintwork was all meticulous done with a paintbrush, and again, this did take some time. Once the paint was dry, the pieces were removed off of the sprue, and then carefully mounted in place. To glue the components to the model, I did not use standard cement or super glue. Clear plastic are one of those type of materials that you really have to be on the ball for. And you cannot use just standard glues because depending on the glue can have some detrimental effects. If you use super glue, Super glue has a habit on having a white gassy substance set when the stuff dries, and that will really cause problems with clear plastic components, so it was not utilized. You don't want to use standard red tube model glue for a multitude of reasons, partially because it's awful, but the other reason is because if you have an accident where you have slightly too much glue added to one little location, it will bleed into the visible portion and the clear, the clear plastic is now ruined because that glue does melt plastic in order to weld itself onto things. So in order to glue clear plastic parts on my models, I like to use standard Elmer's white glue. White glue is exclusively used for this application because of lots of benefits. First, it dries absolutely transparent. So if you do have a slight little bulge or a slight little glob where it doesn't need to be, it could dry and it'll dry in a fairly clear manner and it won't be visible. Also, it's very forgiving. So let's just say the part doesn't turn out all that great. There's a smudge or it moves on you at the last minute. Fear not, just pop the piece off, wipe the glue away, and you could just reinstall the component without any sort of detrimental effects happening to the clear plastic. The only problem with the white glue is that the bond is okay, but it's not nearly as strong as the other two adhesives that I referenced. And because of that, you want to be careful when handling a model utilizing that media. For a static model like this that's just going to be kept in my display case, it's not a problem. But if you're the type of person that likes to play with your models, you can see how it's going to be an issue, but if that's the case, you're going to be breaking lots of other things on a model like this before the clear plastic parts become an issue. But that is something I definitely want to put out there in case anyone was curious how to glue clear plastic parts on. I'm pretty sure some airplane modelers or car modelers out there are gonna 
chime into the comment section with the type of glues that they use and there are specialty glues for clear plastic parts that are out there. However, me personally, I like to roll with the white glue for the benefits that I mentioned before. Jumping back to the headlight portion takes us to the brush guards. So as you can see, the model does have its photo etch brush guards fitted in place. And these are also added to the model at the very, very tail end of the build. Why this is the case is again due to the headlights being made out of clear plastic. These are painted off of the runner, or I should say off of the model while still on the runner, and then they get installed after everything is painted and weathered just to prevent any sort of overspray from ruining the lens portions, which would be anticlimactic, specifically since the pieces are molded and clear. So in order to get these components fitted in place, these are added after the model is thoroughly painted. And to do that, you can't exactly have the brush guard fitted in place for reasons that should be fairly obvious. So these are the type of things that need to be added in a layer type effect. First, the model's built, painted, and weathered. Then the headlights go on, and then the brush guards get fitted in place. The brush guards are thoroughly painted off of the runner, or I should say off of the model again. And another reason why I install these at the very tail end is because of the photo watch nature. Photo etch is a type of material that you really have to have a certain skill set with painting. It seems easy enough, but these type of grills over here, and this is also true for tank, uh, you know, grenade grills, they love to get clogged up with paint very, very, very easily. And painting them is a skill set in its own right. Of course, the pieces are primed first, and then the paint is applied via the airbrush following with the weathering. But again, you have to be on the ball when working with PE. If you do everything appropriately and you play your cards right, you'll get the outcome that you see here where the PE is completely clean and there are absolutely no clunks of paint found on any of the grill sections. And once installed to the model, it yields for some very excellent results. I personally love PE for meshwork. It just takes a little bit of a skill set we're working with. Once you have that stuff locked down, it just makes the builds look so much better. With the model in hand, because trying to get the camera adjusted just right is almost impossible, here we have the winch in better light. As I mentioned before, the winch interior section was something that was scratch built because it was absent on the stock kit, and it's one that once added really does improve the kit immensely in my opinion. Here you can see what it looks like with the stock chain added in place. Now keep in mind, on the real winch, there would be a cable on the inside, and the chain would be connected to the cable, and the chain is only found on the last section of the actual winch itself. The chain is kit supply, it's a nice brass chain, however painting the chain is also a skill set in itself, very similar to what I mentioned before with the photo etch. Regardless, once everything was painted and weathered, it was installed into that little hole that I drilled into the winch section, leaving for the results that you have here. Moving topside takes us to the remainder of the details. We have all the hatches fitted in place, of course, and they are molded, or I should say modeled in the closed position. Pretty much these hatches are actually only intended to be glued in the closed position and the thought about, or I should say the idea of making them in the open position is not really one that can be done and, and to do so you actually have to do a little bit of modification to the kit in order to get the piece rendered in that format. Which with the quality of the interior it's not necessarily a bad thing but that is something I do want to mention specifically if someone wants to make this model use in a diorama. Can it be done? Oh yeah, it can, but you are going to have to do a little bit of creativity to the model in order to do so. But here you can see what it looks like with everything fitted in place. One interesting I want to note is with the guard that we have here on the back portion. This is something that is supplied with the kit, however, it's not intended to be used on this example of the XM706, or at least as per the instructions. The instructions do have a guard, but it's a slightly different shape and it's located in a different area. And you do have to drill out certain portions on the model in order to get it to be built in the stock format. Fortunately, this is well documented in the instructions. However, if you are going to fit this component in place, you are going to have to drill certain holes out differently compared to the other ones. And why this is relevant is because on the B100 that were used in Vietnam, they actually didn't have any sort of guard back here originally. After some infield use, it was determined that it would be a good idea to put a guard in this area just to prevent the gunner from muzzle sweeping any crew member that might be on the back hatch over here using a weapon of one sort or another. So this guard here was fabricated just to prevent that from doing that. The guard is again supplied with the model and I simply just utilize it on this build here 
in the stock format. Once added in place, it does the job pretty well. Moving back takes us to the antenna. The antenna base is the standard spring antenna base found on post-World War II American vehicles, and the component itself is decent. It's not perfect, but it's far from being awful. Again, it's basically right there in the middle. It gives you the idea of the antenna in question, and it glues on as a single piece. On the real unit, this portion over here is a guard and actually is separate from the antenna itself, so it would have a well type of a look to it. And this is something that's best seen on my 1-6 scale counterpart if anyone wants to check it out just to get an idea. Or you could look at the real example of the V100 walkarounds that again are posted on the ECA channel. Regardless, on the kit, the way it's designed, the antenna is integrally molded into the base itself. And this is something that I always reference in my videos that it's not really the best idea to do that because one, the antenna is a bit chunkier, but two, those, or I should say, these type of features just always beckon to be broken. And if the piece is made out of plastic and it snaps, trying to glue it back together is a fool's errand. It never looks good again. In my opinion, it's best just to snip the piece off, drill it out with a small Dremel bit, and then add a piece of floor wire in place, giving you the look that we have here. The piece is more to scale, and also, most importantly, it bends. So if you bump into it with your finger, which you will do during the course of construction or just handling the model, the piece will not crack on you. So again, this is another benefit or something else that I generally like to mention in my videos. Moving further back takes to the exhaust manifold. And on the V100, there are two exhaust stacks on either side, or I should say two mufflers on either side here of this giant tower. And when you're weathering it, you want to weather it in this, in this type of format where we have a little poof over each of these two sections. On later versions of the V100, they had these little ducts in this area over here to, I guess, help funnel the smoke out. But on this, or I should say on the kit version, this is the version that is supplied. And this would be accurate for a vehicle of the early portion of its production life. The kit does also supply you versions where we have exhaust manifolds emerging from the slats and poking out these two sections over here. This is something that is technically correct. However, this feature is more found, or I should say is more of a later feature and are found on vehicles post-Vietnam, but there would be some vehicles in Vietnam service that that little feature over there would not necessarily be something that wouldn't be seen in theater. Moving to the turret, everything here again is stock. The one thing to mention is the little optic found in this guarded section over here. You want to paint the lens accordingly. And then that takes us to the armament. These are the two M37, or I'm sorry, M73s. And the barrel detailing is decent found on these components. You know, it definitely does the job for what they are. I did drill them out with a pin vise in order to get the look that you see here, which is always something I recommend if you have the bit and the steady hand for. If you do not have either of those things, you might just want to omit that because you can easily screw the barrels up and it'll be a detriment as opposed to helping you. As I mentioned before, the turret does not have any sort of interior detailing, so we have the barrels on the outside, but bafflingly, nothing on the inside. So again, if you are going to render this with the open position, you are going to have to scratch build the receiver sections of the M73s. If you are hell-bent on making this thing with the hatch in the open position, I do have some excellent photographs as well as video of the interior portion of the turret found on the ECA channel. I recommend checking that out if you are going to go down that path. The last thing I want to mention about the build itself is with the bodywork. With the way the hull goes together, you are going to have a seam found in this section over here, as well as also this area. The box structure basically plugs in, and it does so pretty well, but there are some seams to contend with. Seams are easily polished down with some sandpaper, some thick super glue, you know, some wet sanding, and you'll be good to go. Some areas where else there are going to be seams to contend with is right here on the front. This entire leaning edge over here is a seam work as well as also on the bottom portion here where the upper makes contact with the lower pan. The seam runs along the wheel wells, as well as also the bottom plate on these two sections. Again, seams are, you know, commonly seen on many models out there, and they are easily as removed on this one as they are on some other premium kits. So, you know, pretty much standard in that regard. 
that's all there is to the build itself. And this brings us to the paint and the markings. For the model's paint work, I painted it in a slightly different format compared to the other V100 that's in my collection. When it comes to post-war, I should say post-World War II and then Vietnam era American vehicles, you do have quite a few different options in painting. There were several different shades of olive drab that were around, and this really just depends on the discretion of the builder. Because I already have the other one in the forest green type coloring. This one here I wanted to go with the darker olive drab color that are seen on many other American vehicles from the same period. The color itself is my own mix of exterior flat latex that was applied with the airbrush. The same exact color are seen on a multitude of other vehicles found on the ECA channel. Then on, once the base coat was dry, first of course the thing was primed as we mentioned before, but after the base coat was added, I then went ahead and weathered it with both some washes as well as also some counter shading. In addition to those techniques, a filter was utilized as well. For the wash, I went with a cream color and for the counter shading, this was done with just thinned out to me a flat black applied with the airbrush. The filter was also an exterior latex and it was another dark shade or a darker shade of olive drab that I utilize on many other builds found on the channel. With all of those techniques added, you get the final result that you have here with the color. It's also important to point out that this one here was the guinea pig and after I built this model here or painted this model here, I utilized the exact same painting techniques on the 1-6 scale counterpart. So if you're seeing this and it looks very familiar to you and again, you're a fan of the channel, that's because this is exactly how I painted the big one and that's why the big one looks like the way it does, and I personally absolutely adore the way that model came out, but you know, that's a topic for another video. Regardless, in addition to the airbrushing, the model also continued with its weathering with the use of Tamiya Panaline Accent. That's also a great product on your build. It will really make it look all that much more polished. And then for the other weathering, this was accomplished with the dry brushing, which again is something that I also reference often on these videos. Aside from the paintwork, the markings were also added. The markings that you see on this model here are the kit supplied water slide decals, and they went on really without any sort of problems. The decal quality supplied with this kit are on par with other kits from the modern era. As for the marking choice itself, the kit does supply you with two options to render this model, and since I already did the other version, well, you know, it's a no-brainer. I'm going to go ahead and render this one with the other option. The decals, once they were applied, were then secured in place with the VMS matte varnish, as again, I always reference in these videos. I absolutely love utilizing that product on my builds. It really just makes everything look all that much more polished and just that much more complete and finalized, as opposed to some other varnishes that are out there as or just leaving them varnish lists. If you are going to build a model with decals, you have to use the varnish. It just really does a good job with sealing everything in place, making everything look as flat as possible, and also, most importantly, it protects the markings from fraying and flaking away, which is something that can happen to a naked decal over time. So, as I repeatedly mentioned in this video, this is the second rendition of the exact same kit that I have in my collection, and while I have the camera out, I might as well go ahead and put the other one on the table. So, here you get to see the two renditions of the exact same kit side by side. Both are primarily built out of the box with the out of the box components. Although on this one here, I went ahead and added that winch mechanism that I referenced before. However, if you do not have the capability of scratch building that component, you can still build the model perfectly fine. Although you just have to just basically ditch the chain on the inside like this one over here. And you know, as you can see, once everything is sealed up, you don't exactly get to look inside the vehicle, but it's just one of those things that once added, it just makes the model seem all that much more complete in my opinion. Another difference between the two is with the little guards that we have over here. This way here, it's how it's rendered out of the box with the out of the box instructions. And this one here is with the alternative that I mentioned before added in place. You can see how much different it makes the model look specifically when compared side by side. And it's a nice way to add a little bit of extra differentiation to the collection where you can have the exact same kit, but built two different ways. And even when you paint them two different ways, like I did over here, as well as marking them, you know, it just, 
you know, it adds a little bit more flavor to the collection. On the topic of the paintwork, well, again, you can see this one here is painted with a slightly different format with different washes as opposed to the other example. And again, both examples would be more than appropriate for the Vietnam War time frame. It just depends on personal choice and preference. Regardless, both will look absolutely excellent if rendered in either way in your collection. One last thing I want to mention, it's something I forgot to mention before, but now I definitely see it with the two side by side, involves the taillights. So the kit wants you to install the taillights in a certain manner, but you do actually have an option that is supplied with the kit, and that involves this, the taillight style. So first, the taillights themselves, I negated to mention before, are also clear plastic, which is an excellent choice. And when you're painting them again, you want to paint the reverse sections and omit the paint found on the lenses because you know, it just makes the piece look nicer. But also on this one over here, you can see how the kit wants you to install these components, where we just have the tail light as a standalone unit mounted to the rear of the model. And this is perfectly accurate. These vehicles had these tail lights in this format during the Vietnam War. However, there was another option that these tail lights were found in, and that is with this option over here where the tail light is actually shrouded. The shrouds are supplied with the kit but are basically a spare part if you follow the out-of-the-box configuration. On this one over here, to give the model a bit of differentiation, I went ahead and rendered this one with the later version of having the taillights that are shrouded. Both were utilized during the Vietnam War, and again, it just boils down to personal preference. But again, it's one of those little features that you can add to your build that will make it look different compared to the other counterpart. As I mentioned earlier in the video, if you are scratch building or working on a 1-6 scale build like this one here, it's always good to have a smaller scale counterpart just as a builder's aid, but you don't want to solely depend on a 135 because a lot of times these kit manufacturers take some shortcuts, as I mentioned before, and you can unwittingly carry those shortcomings into the larger scale counterpart. So that is something to be aware of, but as a rule of thumb, a 135th scale counterpart is definitely something that could really assist in your 1-6 scale build, regardless of whatever vehicle it may be. In the end, there's really nothing much more I could have expected out of this build over here, and with it being my second go around, all of the chips lined up exactly perfectly, and the build went together extremely effortlessly. Of course, when you go through a build and it's nice smooth sailing and there aren't any surprises along the way, that always makes for a pleasant situation. And of course, this brings us into skill level and recommendation. So, like I mentioned in the first video of this exact same build, all that information is basically true. So, this model here is not one that I would recommend for a beginner. If you've never touched a plastic model kit before, perhaps this one here you might want to avoid for a little while until you build up some of those basic skills. Because the model does have things like clear plastic parts as well as photo etch, these are things that, or I should say, these are features that are above someone's skill level if they are just starting out in this hobby. This is something that's best built by an individual that already has about a dozen or so builds under their belt, and they have the basics squared away. Things like seam removal, as well as also, like I said before, dealing and working with clear plastic parts as well as photo etch. And at this point here, you're more or less an intermediate builder. Of course, if a intermediate builder can tackle one of these models, so can an advance. In addition to just being able to work with the stock components, there are several aftermarket detail sets out there made out of both cast resin and photo etch, to name a few, and all of these can be added to the model to enhance it from the stock condition, which, if you are an advanced builder, may be something that you might want to navigate towards, as the stock detailing, although it's basic and gets you off the ground, perhaps someone with an advanced skill set might feel that the kit is a bit overly simplistic and may want to enhance it further from what the stock kit gives you. But of course, this is best left up to the discretion of the builder. Skipping into recommendations, if you are an avid fan of the V100 and you are a rivet counting snob, where you want this model here to be basically a miniaturized version of the real one, where they take the real one, they shrink it down to 135th scale, and make a kit out of it. If that's you and that's what you're looking for, then this may not be the kit for you. As I mentioned before, as 
enjoyable as the kit is, it does have several shortcomings to it, some of which may be the type of thing that will turn off the type of individual that I just mentioned. Now, can the model be enhanced from the stock condition into something that is more or less to that type of individual's liking? The answer is yes, but you are going to have to do a bit of extra elbow grease in order to do so. So much so that some people out there, it just, the juice just might not be worth the squeeze in that case. So, you know, you may want to plan accordingly. However, if you're just a casual fan of the vehicle and you're just looking to have this vehicle represented in your collection in 135th scale, then this one here is recommended for you. If you're a fan of US military vehicles, Cold War military vehicles, or just a fan of the Vietnam War in general, and you like to collect vehicles like the M113, the M48 Patton, or several versions of the M151 Mutt, well, in that case, this kit here is definitely going to be one on your recommended list. Another person who I'd recommend this kit to would be anyone who's an avid fan of wheeled armored cars. If you have vehicles like the BTR or the BRDM, well, the V100 here will fit into that collection, again, without batting an eye. Because of the vehicle subject matter, as well as with the limited interior detailing that it does have, this would lend itself for some diorama use. Although, as I mentioned before, the interior does have some deficiencies to it, if you are clever enough and you jam-pack the interior with a bunch of scratch-built parts as well as also lots of equipment and gear, perhaps this is something that can enhance the model and better tailor it for that role. This vehicle here, being such a iconic vehicle from the Vietnam War time frame, is definitely one that lends itself to some interesting diorama depictions. This model does have several benefits to it. The availability is pretty good. The costs are also very reasonable and they do build it into a decent piece fairly quickly. Of course, this one here went together a little bit faster compared to the first one, but that again comes with, you know, doing something a second time around. But regardless, even the first time around, this build was one that went together fairly quickly and mostly effortlessly. With all these positive attributes, it just makes for a pleasant build experience as a whole. And that's really all there is need to be said about that. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale Cadillac Gauge V100 Armor Car, also known as the XM706. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep in loop a new post of content being 135th scale model showcase videos like this one over here or the larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted. Another way to keep in loop a new post of content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build as well as photographs of the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.